Now open your question paper and look at part 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. Spare a thought for the Swansea sculptor Peter Nicholas. In the early 1970s, the Welsh artist created a celebrated work in aluminium entitled Seagulls. This was commissioned for £4,000 by Glamorgan County Council and has hung in the departure lounge of Cardiff Airport ever since. That's what Nicholas assumed anyway, until he received a phone call from a woman who had found a pair of twisted metal birds lying in a skip and wondered if the sculptor would give her a hand with some welding. Peter, how did you feel when you realised what had happened? I was absolutely devastated, and I really didn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. This was a major piece of sculpture I had made. Probably it would be worth about £40,000 today. But after the airport was sold to the consortium TBI, the sculpture had to be taken down, broken up and dumped in a skip. Has anyone explained how this could have happened or offered you an apology? Hmm. Nobody will take responsibility, let alone offer me an apology. I would have liked the opportunity at the very least to reset or even to recycle the sculpture in another public place. It seems to me that artists in Wales are neglected at the best of times, but for the region's international airport to have treated one of its homegrown artists so shoddily is particularly disgraceful. Spare a thought for the Swansea sculptor Peter Nicholas. In the early 1970s, the Welsh artist created a celebrated work in aluminium entitled Seagulls. This was commissioned for £4,000 by Glamorgan County Council and has hung in the departure lounge of Cardiff Airport ever since. That's what Nicholas assumed anyway, until he received a phone call from a woman who had found a pair of twisted metal birds lying in a skip and wondered if the sculptor would give her a hand with some welding. Peter, how did you feel when you realised what had happened? I was absolutely devastated, and I really didn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. This was a major piece of sculpture I had made. Probably it would be worth about £40,000 today. But after the airport was sold to the consortium TBI, the sculpture had to be taken down, broken up and dumped in a skip. Has anyone explained how this could have happened or offered you an apology? Hmm. Nobody will take responsibility, let alone offer me an apology. I would have liked the opportunity at the very least to reset or even to recycle the sculpture in another public place. It seems to me that artists in Wales are neglected at the best of times, but for the region's international airport to have treated one of its homegrown artists so shoddily is particularly disgraceful. Extract 2 West End Theatre has something to offer everyone. To find out what's on, pick up a free London Theatre Guide, available at all West End Theatres or your hotel. The guide also has information on the many concessions available for students and senior citizens. Students should call the Midland Bank Student Theatre Line on 0207 329 8900 for standby concessions after 2pm. Another great bargain is the half-price ticket booth in Leicester Square, which sells tickets on the day only 
for a wide selection of shows at half price plus a small service fee. Matinee tickets go on sale at 12 noon. Evening performances from 1 p.m. The brand new Theatreland walking tour map offers a fascinating journey around the most famous West End theatres, providing historical vignettes and anecdotes about the West End's most illustrious personalities. For a clear seating plan of all 50 West End theatres, plus information on how to book, transport, restaurants, disabled access, etc., purchase a copy of the Complete Guide to London's West End Theatres. Both publications can be purchased at the British Travel Centre in Regent Street. Whatever your plans in London, don't leave without seeing a West End show, one of the true highlights London has to offer. West End Theatre has something to offer everyone. To find out what's on, pick up a free London Theatre Guide, available at all West End Theatres or your hotel. The guide also has information on the many concessions available for students and senior citizens. Students should call the Midland Bank Student Theatre Line on 0207 329 8900 for standby concessions after 2pm. Another great bargain is the half-price ticket booth in Leicester Square, which sells tickets on the day only for a wide selection of shows at half price plus a small service fee. Matinee tickets go on sale at 12 noon. Evening performances from 1pm. The brand new Theatreland walking tour map offers a fascinating journey around the most famous West End theatres, providing historical vignettes and anecdotes about the West End's most illustrious personalities. For a clear seating plan of all 50 West End theatres, plus information on how to book, transport, restaurants, disabled access, etc., purchase a copy of the Complete Guide to London's West End Theatres. Both publications can be purchased at the British Travel Centre in Regent Street. Whatever your plans in London, don't leave without seeing a West End show, one of the true highlights London has to offer. Extract 3 When abstract artist Sir Terry Frost discovered his flair for the artistic, his canvases were Hessian pillows, and his paints were stolen and mixed with oil from Red Cross sardine tins. But you have to make do when you're a prisoner of war. It would be easy to understand any feelings of residual bitterness from the artist who spent four years in his mid-twenties holed up in a prison camp, Yet Frost, now 82, and knighted earlier this year, describes the experience as the best education he could have had. Terry, tell us something about your career. My first exhibition, comprising still lifes and portraits of my fellow prisoners, was held in my absence in 1944 at my hometown of Leamington Spa. It was not until the 1950s that I had with my new wife Kathleen, moved to Cornwall to study at the St Ives School of Painting and developed my vocabulary of shapes, arcs, wedges, circles and chevrons in pulsating colours, which reflected the surrounding seascape. What I do is a lot more than just making shapes. It's a philosophical thing, a way of life. It's a matter of letting yourself go and not having any inhibitions or preconceived ideas. You spent some time as Professor of Painting at Reading University, didn't you? That's right. Then, in the early 1970s, we returned to Cornwall and settled near Penzance, where I've continued to live ever since. Tell us about your latest piece. 
Each colour and shape stands for itself and has to be accounted for. I used collage because I wanted to have positive shapes as well as positive colour, rather like two-dimensional sculpture. With a piece like this, your head is on the guillotine with every mark you make. But it is one of the best I have ever done. When abstract artist Sir Terry Frost discovered his flair for the artistic, his canvases were Hessian pillows, and his paints were stolen and mixed with oil from Red Cross sardine tins. But you have to make do when you're a prisoner of war. It would be easy to understand any feelings of residual bitterness from the artist who spent four years in his mid-twenties holed up in a prison camp, Yet Frost, now 82, and knighted earlier this year, describes the experience as the best education he could have had. Terry, tell us something about your career. My first exhibition, comprising still lifes and portraits of my fellow prisoners, was held in my absence in 1944 at my hometown of Leamington Spa. It was not until the 1950s that I had with my new wife Kathleen, moved to Cornwall to study at the St Ives School of Painting and developed my vocabulary of shapes, arcs, wedges, circles and chevrons in pulsating colours, which reflected the surrounding seascape. What I do is a lot more than just making shapes. It's a philosophical thing, a way of life. It's a matter of letting yourself go and not having any inhibitions or preconceived ideas. You spent some time as Professor of Painting at Reading University, didn't you? That's right. Then, in the early 1970s, we returned to Cornwall and settled near Penzance, where I've continued to live ever since. Tell us about your latest piece. Each colour and shape stands for itself, and has to be accounted for. I used collage because I wanted to have positive shapes as well as positive colour, rather like two-dimensional sculpture. With a piece like this, your head is on the guillotine with every mark you make, but it is one of the best I have ever done. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Part 2. You will hear a radio report about the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at Part 2. Today, Ruth Adams will be reporting from the famous Getty Art Museum in Los Angeles. It is a modern museum with an impressive collection of both old masters and contemporary works. Ruth Adams reports. From the motorway, the San Diego Freeway Interstate Highway 405, it looks as if a great ocean-going liner has been dumped inland on a hillside after a flood, White and silver-tinted office blocks tumble down the landscape like a shiny shanty town. From a distance, the new Getty is not beautiful. Once the hill has been achieved, however, via a four-car tram or ultra-modern funicular, which is the obligatory mode of approach, everything changes. 
Everything is modern, high tech, yet has the feel too of a Tuscan hilltop village. You half expect flat-hatted senators from Piero della Francesca to be strolling on the arrival piazza where the tram deposits you. The new Getty consists of six structures, and architecture buffs will want to pore over every one. The shapes and materials could only be the work of Richard Meyer, and the locals are already talking of this as his masterpiece. That's L.A. for you. For the rest of us, there are four attractions in this order: the museum, the view, the garden, and the restaurant. For all the noise being made just now about the Getty's opening, the culmination of fifteen years of planning and building, the museum is not large, and one does not really need instructions on how to structure a visit, other than to warn you not to arrive before eleven a.m. The first two hours of the day being devoted to school groups. The museum's strengths are European painting, mainly fifteenth to nineteenth centuries, European sculpture, the decorative arts, predominantly French eighteenth century, and antiquities. In the center of mass culture, we have a high culture temple. Each specialism is housed in its own pavilion. Grouped around a central courtyard, so you can do them one at a time, taking a break every so often to admire the view. Never was a museum set in such a sensational location. To the west, there is the Pacific Ocean, vast, deep blue or shimmering gold, depending on the sun. To the south, the eye follows the San Diego Freeway. All ten lanes snaking past LAX, Los Angeles Airport, until it is swallowed by the smog. East lies the desert and the mountains. The high rises of downtown LA are dwarfed by this magnificent theater of nature. Only the old masters can compare in beauty. The Getty's Garden is, for the moment, a disappointment. And this being California, the restaurant is long on salads, pulses, designer water, a post-tobacco world where alcohol is already the love that dares not speak its name. Never mind, there is always the view. There is one important structure that is easy to overlook: the parking structure. Despite its unlovely name. Says more about L.A. than Van Gogh or Piero della Francesca ever could. This building, all seven levels of it, six below ground, is highly efficient, well lit, and clean. It is itself a work of art. Now you will hear part two again. Today, Ruth Adams will be reporting from the famous Getty Art Museum in Los Angeles. It is a modern museum with an impressive collection of both old masters and contemporary works. Ruth Adams reports. From the motorway, the San Diego Freeway, Interstate Highway 405, it looks as if a great ocean-going liner has been dumped inland on a hillside after a flood. White and silver-tinted office blocks tumble down the landscape like a shiny shanty town. From a distance, the new Getty is not beautiful. Once the hill has been achieved, however, via a four-car tram or ultra-modern funicular, which is the obligatory mode of approach, everything changes. Everything is modern, high-tech, yet has the feel too of a Tuscan hilltop village. You half expect flat-hatted senators from Piero della Francesca to be strolling on the arrival piazza where the tram deposits you. The new Getty consists of six structures, and architecture buffs will want to pore over every one. The shapes and materials could only be the work of Richard Meyer, and the locals are already talking of this as his masterpiece. That's L.A. for you. 
For the rest of us, there are four attractions in this order. The museum, the view, the garden, and the restaurant. For all the noise being made just now about the Getty's opening, the culmination of 15 years of planning and building, the museum is not large, and one does not really need instructions on how to structure a visit, other than to warn you not to arrive before 11am, the first two hours of the day being devoted to school groups. The museum's strengths are European painting, mainly 15th to 19th centuries, European sculpture, the decorative arts, predominantly French 18th century, and antiquities. In the centre of mass culture, we have a high culture temple. Each specialism is housed in its own pavilion, grouped around a central courtyard, so you can do them one at a time, taking a break every so often to admire the view. Never was a museum set in such a sensational location. To the west, there is the Pacific Ocean, vast, deep blue or shimmering gold, depending on the sun. To the south, the eye follows the San Diego Freeway, all ten lanes snaking past LAX Los Angeles Airport until it is swallowed by the smog. East lies the desert and the mountains. The high-rises of downtown LA are dwarfed by this magnificent theatre of nature. Only the old masters can compare in beauty. The Getty's Garden is, for the moment, a disappointment. And this being California, the restaurant is long on salads, pulses, designer water, a post-tobacco world where alcohol is already the love that dares not speak its name. Never mind, there is always the view. There is one important structure that is easy to overlook. The parking structure, despite its unlovely name, says more about L.A. than Van Gogh or Piero della Francesco ever could. This building, all seven levels of it, six below ground, is highly efficient, well-lit and clean. It is itself a work of art. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with the painter Bridget Riley on how her work is influenced by travelling. For questions 16 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have a minute in which to look at part three. Today, we have the celebrated artist Bridget Riley in the studio. Bridget, how does such a hard-working painter of your fame relax? What do you like to do when you have the time to go on holiday? I don't go on holidays just to relax. I would find lying on a beach hot, uncomfortable and pretty unendurable. The sort of holiday I take is part and parcel of my work as a painter. Working in a studio is the heart of the matter, as with any artist, but going out and looking has been vitally important to me for as long as I can remember. 
Is it true then that your mother had a strong influence on you artistically when you were young? Yes, indeed. I was first encouraged to look by my mother. We were in Cornwall during the war, which was in itself a kind of wonderful holiday. And she used to take my sister and me on long walks, pointing things out. Look at the shape of the cloud. The lovely thing about walking through the country is that nothing looks the same twice. If you walk with the sun behind you, the colours are saturated. The sky is solid blue, the sea resplendent in turquoises, greens, even violets. And along the paths, tamarisks, gorse and stony lichen are like a moving frieze of pinks, greens and yellows. But walking along the same path into the sun, the colours are virtually bleached out, almost black and white. I see. What was it like growing up in the 40s and 50s? In post-war Britain, with rationing, clothes coupons and £35 a year travel allowance, people didn't travel a great deal. My first trip abroad was in the 1950s to Paris. We stayed at the Hotel Louisiana, a run-down place in the Rue de Seine. What was your trip to Paris like? What did you do there? We looked at exhibitions, read books. Until then, there were very few books on modern art. I simply devoured John Rule's books on Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, Roger Shattuck's The Banquet Years, about Paris at the beginning of the century, and documents of modern art. But most of all, we argued furiously over dinner about what we had seen. I vividly remember seeing Manet's Olympia and Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe at the Jeu de Paume. Staggering! And all those Monets! Oh, it was a feast, and I just couldn't get enough of it. Do you still visit museums and galleries often? Um... I mean, do they influence and inspire you? For me, visiting museums is a special holiday, a journey in time through which one discovers partners in imagination and whole new areas of creative adventure. It is extraordinary how, by looking at works of art, remote though they might be, one finds a way through to the unique character of a place, a culture, even under a guise. And you've been to Egypt recently, haven't you? Yes, and I went in the spring, but it wasn't the first time I'd been there. On my first visit to Egypt, I travelled with my sister and the art historian Robert Kudielka. Of course, we saw all the great monuments, Saqqara, El Giza, Karnak and Luxor, but I couldn't help noticing how the strips of vegetation on each side of the Nile stood out against the white escarpment of the desert. It was like the beads and bands of their ancient jewellery. The desert became a stupendous stage for their ancient civilization. Suddenly I saw the roll, those reds, Blacks, blues, turquoises and whites played in ancient Egypt's everyday equipment. The wall hangings, illuminations, sarcophagi, they were the colours to celebrate life and well-being, the gifts of sunshine. Although I later recreated those colours in my paintings, I never deliberately searched for material that may be useful to me in the studio. It would spoil the very sensation that I take back. Sometimes the experience has proved so powerful that it was, and still is, practically inaccessible. Hmm. Bridget, thank you very much. It's been fascinating talking to you. Now you will hear part three again. Today, we have the celebrated artist Bridget Riley in the studio. Bridget, how does such a hard-working painter of your fame relax? What do you like to do when you have the time to go on holiday? 
I don't go on holidays just to relax. I would find lying on a beach hot, uncomfortable and pretty unendurable. The sort of holiday I take is part and parcel of my work as a painter. Working in a studio is the heart of the matter, as with any artist, but going out and looking has been vitally important to me for as long as I can remember. Is it true then that your mother had a strong influence on you artistically when you were young? Yes, indeed. I was first encouraged to look by my mother. We were in Cornwall during the war, which was in itself a kind of wonderful holiday. And she used to take my sister and me on long walks, pointing things out. Look at the shape of the cloud. The lovely thing about walking through the country is that nothing looks the same twice. If you walk with the sun behind you, the colours are saturated. The sky is solid blue, the sea resplendent in turquoises, greens, even violets. And along the paths, tamarisks, gorse and stony lichen are like a moving frieze of pinks, greens and yellows. But walking along the same path into the sun, the colours are virtually bleached out, almost black and white. I see. What was it like growing up in the 40s and 50s? In post-war Britain, with rationing, clothes coupons and £35 a year travel allowance, people didn't travel a great deal. My first trip abroad was in the 1950s to Paris. We stayed at the Hotel Louisiana, a run-down place in the Rue de Seine. What was your trip to Paris like? What did you do there? We looked at exhibitions, read books. Until then, there were very few books on modern art. I simply devoured John Rule's books on Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. Roger Shattuck's The Banquet Years, about Paris at the beginning of the century and documents of modern art. But most of all, we argued furiously over dinner about what we had seen. I vividly remember seeing Manet's Olympia and Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe at the Jeu de Paume. Staggering! And all those Monets! Oh, it was a feast, and I just couldn't get enough of it. Do you still visit museums and galleries often? Um... I mean, do they influence and inspire you? For me, visiting museums is a special holiday, a journey in time through which one discovers partners in imagination and whole new areas of creative adventure. It is extraordinary how, by looking at works of art, remote though they might be, one finds a way through to the unique character of a place, a culture, even under a guise. And you've been to Egypt recently, haven't you? Yes, and I went in the spring, but it wasn't the first time I'd been there. On my first visit to Egypt, I travelled with my sister and the art historian Robert Kudielka. Of course, we saw all the great monuments, Saqqara, El Giza, Karnak and Luxor but I couldn't help noticing how the strips of vegetation on each side of the Nile stood out against the white escarpment of the desert. It was like the beads and bands of their ancient jewellery. The desert became a stupendous stage for their ancient civilization. Suddenly I saw the roll, those reds, Blacks, blues, turquoises and whites played in ancient Egypt's everyday equipment. The wall hangings, illuminations, sarcophagi, they were the colours to celebrate life and well-being, the gifts of sunshine. Although I later recreated those colours in my paintings, I never deliberately searched for material that may be useful to me in the studio. It would spoil the very sensation that I take back. Sometimes the experience has proved so powerful that it was, and still is, practically inaccessible. Hmm. Bridget, thank you very much. It's been fascinating talking to you.
That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which different people talk about holidays they prefer. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H what type of holiday each speaker went on. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H the reason why each speaker prefers that particular type of holiday. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part four. Speaker 1 When I go on holiday, I don't want to venture far for things. This is why I prefer to spend my holidays with my husband on a liner. This way we get to see everything we want to see, but we have the same luxuries as we have back home. I know some people disapprove of them, and I would have agreed with those dissenters when I was younger. But I've found as I get older... I can't fight my body any more. I don't need thrills at my time of life. I need comfort. Speaker 2 It's so easy just to pop over to an almost unending number of cities across the globe these days. I suppose I belong to the no-frills airline generation, who see travel as an essential part of life. I don't have as much time as I had when I was a student to lounge around the world at my leisure, but I refuse to give up my love of seeing new things and meeting new people. Some people might not think I spend enough time in them to be able to genuinely appreciate the places I visit, but I don't really have a choice. It's a compromise between my career and my love of travel. Speaker 3 we're pretty typical as a family in terms of what we do on holiday. We usually simply book a package deal and go. It's the cheapest way when you've got a family. As much as I would love to go trekking in the Himalayas and bungee jumping in Australia, it would be too expensive to take the kids along as well. I mean, I suppose we could leave the kids with my parents, but I don't think it would be fair to leave them without a holiday. So, package holidays, making sandcastles is what we have to put up with for now. Speaker 4 I've been doing it since I was a kid. In the summer holidays, we used to go into the countryside picking blackberries and generally causing havoc with the farmers. It was always in good humour, though. We were naughty, but never cruel. When we got tired, we simply pitched a makeshift tent and slept where we were. Our parents would be worried sick about us. These were the days before mobile phones, remember, so they never knew where we were. That was the appeal of the countryside, the feeling of being free. And that is why I still pack up a sleeping bag every now and then and head into the wilderness. Speaker 5 the first time I went was on a school trip. Such trips were organised once a year, and I fancied not having to attend lessons for a few days, so I persuaded my mother and signed up. At first I found all the equipment and specialist clothing cumbersome and unfashionable, but after a while I got used to them. I'll never forget the feeling the first time I slid down a piece without falling. It really was exhilarating. 
The thing I love the most about it is that you can challenge yourself with more and more difficult slopes each time you go. Now you will hear part four again. Speaker one. When I go on holiday, I don't want to venture far for things. This is why I prefer to spend my holidays with my husband on a liner. This way we get to see everything we want to see, but we have the same luxuries as we have back home. I know some people disapprove of them, and I would have agreed with those dissenters when I was younger. But I've found as I get older, I can't fight my body any more. I don't need thrills at my time of life. I need comfort. Speaker 2 It's so easy just to pop over to an almost unending number of cities across the globe these days. I suppose I belong to the no-frills airline generation, who see travel as an essential part of life. I don't have as much time as I had when I was a student to lounge around the world at my leisure, but I refuse to give up my love of seeing new things and meeting new people. Some people might not think I spend enough time in them to be able to genuinely appreciate the places I visit, but I don't really have a choice. It's a compromise between my career and my love of travel. Speaker 3 we're pretty typical as a family in terms of what we do on holiday. We usually simply book a package deal and go. It's the cheapest way when you've got a family. As much as I would love to go trekking in the Himalayas and bungee jumping in Australia, it would be too expensive to take the kids along as well. I mean, I suppose we could leave the kids with my parents, but I don't think it would be fairer to leave them without a holiday. So, package holidays, making sandcastles is what we have to put up with for now. Speaker 4 I've been doing it since I was a kid. In the summer holidays, we used to go into the countryside picking blackberries and generally causing havoc with the farmers. It was always in good humour, though. We were naughty, but never cruel. When we got tired, we simply pitched a makeshift tent and slept where we were. Our parents would be worried sick about us. These were the days before mobile phones, remember, so they never knew where we were. That was the appeal of the countryside, the feeling of being free. And that is why I still pack up a sleeping bag every now and then and head into the wilderness. Speaker 5 the first time I went was on a school trip. Such trips were organised once a year, and I fancied not having to attend lessons for a few days, so I persuaded my mother and signed up. At first I found all the equipment and specialist clothing cumbersome and unfashionable, but after a while I got used to them. I'll never forget the feeling the first time I slid down a piece without falling. It really was exhilarating. The thing I love the most about it is that you can challenge yourself with more and more difficult slopes each time you go. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left so that you are sure to finish in time.